Hello YouTube, in this video I'm going to cover a certain portion of the Nucleus Overload protocol that I completely forgot to talk about in my three-part series. So this is going to be part four and it's going to be completed because a very um, attentive subscriber noticed that some information didn't feel right in part one and they were completely correct. The information was not something that I prescribed at all but the way I presented it was extremely confusing. So basically, to go over it quickly, in the video of part one, I explained what Nucleus Overload is, and if you don't know what it is, go check it out. And I sort of went over the way you would apply it in your program, but I never specified reps, sets, or frequency. I sort of glanced over it. And at some point, I give an example of what would be regarded as irrelevant intensity windows and the rep range that would correspond to that, and I spoke about the 40 to 50 to 60 reps. And then I followed up by saying that I do that, meaning that I said I do between 40 and 50 reps. And that was immediately, of course, confusing because it sounded like I said, for Nucleus Overload, you do 40 to 60 reps per set. That, of course, is not the case. I wouldn't say it's completely useless, but it's so out there in the realm of rep ranges that even for something that is supposed to be low intensity, this is way too high. And that's why in part one, I explained that the intensity manipulation and the intensity accumulation of such rep rangers was just completely useless. It's just a waste of time. That being said, I do sometimes go in higher rep ranges for nucleus overload. I do sometimes go in lower rep ranges for nucleus overload. There is no prescribed rep range for that practice. The only prescribed uh, prescribance, I don't know the term in English, the only predicament is going to be that you stay in intensity windows that are not challenging. That's it. If you do a movement that is challenging, this is not nucleus overload, okay? So you're going to have two choices. Either you are going to do it in lower rep ranges, but you're going to send back, so you're going to by, by, uh, by uh, design, pick an intensity window that is not challenging at all. Or you're going to go high intensity, meaning you're going to go to failure, which is what the peak of intensity represents, it's failure. This is why you're supposed to train to failure. And you're going to actually experiment that failure, but you're going to do it within a rep range. That means that 95% of the reps were not challenging. And you fell because of you know, lactic acid accumulation, the pump, mechanical failure, whatever you want to call it. But in reality, it wasn't a high intensity set at all. It's just that the muscle failed eventually. The two practices are perfectly workable and they both work for nucleus overload, but they both mean different things in the way you're going to apply them. The first one means that you're going to do a sandbagging tactic, which is basically a rep in the tank tactic. So you're going to stop yourself through just your mental ability to decide that this is enough reps because nothing else is going to tell you that this is enough reps. It's going to be up to you. The second one is going to be to pick a rep range that is, that is going to create that failure so that at some point you can't go anymore, which requires to pick a certain level of resistance that is going to be enough that you fail around 20 to 25 reps because you don't want to have to do 40 reps to finally fail. And also because if you know about that type of, uh, of that type of things and if you understand the baseline, the funny thing about very high rep work with zero intensity is that you recover during the set, meaning that during certain portions of the negative or positive, the muscle catches up basically because it's so irrelevant to it that you could potentially go forever. For example, if you do this, it's a little bit of a strange motion. I will give you that. But this is resistance training without resistance so it's calisthenics okay what does that work well you can say the forearms you can say parts of the bicep okay how long can i go doing that i have no idea but i can tell you that i can go for a very long time why because it's not weighted so basically the, the muscle is not even tickled so i'm not going to do that for the rest of the video but it, it's just going to not represent something that is even capable of getting you to failure or if it is it's going to take an hour so you don't do that that's also the reason why i wanted to make that video is because i don't want people to go in such high rep ranges and i understand why people got confused it was my fault 100 percent 
is because the way I described nucleus overload with the low intensity principle, it, sent, it looked like I was saying that in that particular case, you could apply super high rep ranges. You can't, meaning that for me, and I make videos about it because it's important to describe, I think, my striking range for hypertrophy is going to be 2 to 15 reps, okay? I prefer to be in the 6 to 12, okay? And then there are parameters of strength work and back offsets that exist within that, and each lift has its own thing. But for nucleus overload, I can push that to 25 reps. So for nucleus overload, I'm going to stay between 4 and 25 reps, which sounds strange, because why 4? 4 is going to be mostly what I do for certain lifts to warm up for the nucleus overload, because yes, you want to warm up also for nucleus overload. You don't just jump into it. And now that that has been established and that I sort of corrected what I said, let's talk about reps, sets, and frequency, because it's a missing part of the nucleus overload discussion. For some reason, I didn't discuss it. And I think I know why is because I like to let you guys discover your own things. I don't want to uh, poison your mind with my protocols. I just like to give you uh, concepts and then you apply it because most of the time you're going to find something that works uh, much better for you than something that I would have said. So I'm going to tell you what I do and uh, it's not an invitation to do it yourself, but it's, it might give you a, a rough idea of the way you should apply it. So for me. I do nucleus overload for my neck, my lats, my triceps, my calves, and that's pretty much, and my traps, so that's five. That's five muscle groups that I, uh, I'm using nucleus overload on. For uh, traps, for traps, I am going to stay between the 10, the, sorry, the six to uh, sometimes, sometimes 20 reps for the, the traps because they're quite resilient. And that, that fluctu the fluctuation within the rep range is all over the place. Meaning that when I warm up, I'm going to warm up with a very low weight because every time I do a pull, I do a shrug or a weighted stretch, which is amazing for the traps. And sometimes I will start with 135 and I'll do 20 shrugs because it's baby weight. And then I'll get to 275 and I can only do six. So it's, it doesn't reflect proper intensity manipulations because I will often start with higher rep ranges and then drill them down to six to then at some point in the workout, go back to 20. That's something that is going to be completely correlated with what you like to do. At the end of the day, nucleus overload is tonnage accumulation. So as long as you can do the reps and it's not a struggle, do it. As far as the frequency for traps, it's usually two, yeah, two to four times a week because they recover quick. And it, the traps is also, and I discussed that in length, but when you do nucleus overload, you sort of want to do muscles that are not going to be conducive to structural failure because you don't want to get injured because of that. The traps will never fail, meaning that they can have some level of um, responsibility when it comes to thoracic rounding, but it's minimal. I've never really experienced it. The, the posterior chain will fail much sooner or the rhomboids or something else before those guys do. Because I do it for upper traps. Triceps. Triceps is the one where I sort of laid the confusion in the first video because I sometimes do 30 reps for triceps. I just like to go higher and also the, the means that I have for tricep extensions are bent. So I have to do more reps just by definition. It's going to be the same for you. And depending on the exercise too, sometimes I will do behind the head extensions and I'll do six to 10 reps, uh, but I will just spread it across the sets. As far as the sets for the traps, sorry, I didn't, I didn't say it. I jumped to frequency immediately. As far as the sets for the traps, it's my higher set uh, scheme for the nucleus overload because I can often do eight to 10. And uh, I say it's the highest because with the number of reps I do, it represents the most tonnage because it's such a small muscle group and a small range of motion, which most people don't realize with the traps, which makes it easier to work because it recovers faster. So as far as the triceps go for the set, it's my lower set selection because I often do three to four sets, but this is why I push the reps. I also do it because since I utilize my triceps every two days and for me they are small and weak, even though they do enjoy higher frequency, they don't have the capacity within the workout to handle a lot of volume, or if they do, I'm going to burn them out and they, they won't be responding when I have to do presses, which I want to avoid. 
So that explains that. As far as neck goes, neck is sort of the same with traps. I'm not too worried about the neck giving up. So uh, the reason why I do less, uh, more reps and sets on the neck is because of that. But also because I think that you shouldn't do too high intensity rep ranges for the neck because you don't want an injury there. So I usually do four to six, seven sets on any given day. And the frequency for neck is fixated. It never changes. It's three times a week. For me, I stay with three times a week. After that, I have the calves. Calves are, resp for me, responding very well to high volume, higher rep ranges. Again, I don't do high intensity, but I do diversify my intensity windows. So if I do body weight calves, I will go up, again, same logic, to sometimes 25, 30 reps. If I do it with weight, I'm going to do a good old 6 to 10, 8 to 12. And the two feed into each other. But the nucleus overload part of this is the, uh, the high rep range, okay? The one that I do with weight doesn't necessarily mean that it cannot be nucleus overload because you can nucleus overload with weight because weight is just resistance. But within any parameters of nucleus overload, I do believe that you need to include its strength work pendant. So one is going to exist in a strictly more intensive uh, wood, in a sense. So as far as the neck goes, neck curls all day every day and as i said sometimes you have four to seven uh, sets and i tend to do eight to twelve ten to fifteen reps in every direction and after that so i did neck traps calves triceps and the last is what was the last it's going to escape me calves triceps oh boy I know that there's something. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to remember it. But before, I just want to uh, quickly go over what I just said because it might be confusing for some people. The nucleus overload principle can be applied with body weight. It can be applied with weights. It's up to you. Understand that if you do it with weights, depending on the body part, you might have to do it with less reps because the intensity is going to be elevated in a sense but it needs to always be a weight that is not challenging. And just to go, ah, the lats. That's the one, the last part, the body part that I want to talk about, the lats. The lats is the last body part that I use for nucleus overload. Uh, I do pullovers with, for lats strictly because they're amazing. I love the way they feel. And for the lats, it's also the, the one that triggered the discussion because I like to stay in lower rep ranges for the lat. Because at some point within the pullover set, I start losing the feeling of the lats working and I tend to feel too much uh, long out of the triceps which is not the goal here. So I will do usually 4 to 12 reps on the lats but I usually like the 5 to 7 rep striking zone. I, I really feel comfortable within them. And the set uh, selection for the lats is usually going to represent something that is going to be 3 to sometimes 7 to 8. So I'm really opening up the range. And that's also when we start talking about weight selection, because as I said, those can be weighted. But when you weight them, you need to keep in mind that the action of weighting them doesn't induce the action of progressing on the weight on the bar. Just because it's weighted doesn't mean you're going to try and put more weight on it. You can stay with the same weight forever. It's much better in terms of progression, not performance progression, progression within the scheme for nucleus overload to multiply the sets or multiply the reps and stay at the same weight. That's my personal opinion. And you might think, huh, but that's, that's strange because it's not conducive to tonnage progression, at least not as much as putting weight on the bar. You would be true, but you are still wrong in a sense because if you were to apply that principle to strength work, you would be uh, amiss at some point because the set multiplication is not that great. You don't have a wide area of sets that you do in a week. For nucleus overload, it's the opposite. You do so many sets that if you can just slap an additional rep on each set, you just added 10 reps. So that's a lot of tonnage. That's a lot of additional tonnage. And because nucleus overload is going to represent a portion of the tonnage that is already so massive, but so irrelevant in terms of intensity windows, it's just the, the easiest way to grow it instead of pushing the intensity. Because if you push the intensity, what you're going to end up realizing is you're not doing nucleus overload anymore. You're doing strength work at some point, or you're doing 
a variation, you're doing an exercise or a back offset, it's not nucleus overload. So I'm not saying never progress on them, but you should progress when the ability to multiply the reps and the sets starts entering what I would describe as irrelevant windows of reps, as far as the reps, as far as the, the, the ability to multiply and get to failure and everything I explained before. And as for the set, it's going to be a purely chronological matter because since you're supposed to superset nucleus overload, you can only superset something within a set. So if you run out of sets where you can actually do the nucleus overload within a synergistic programming, then what do you do? Well, you don't do anything because you're out of luck. So you have to add weight. That's when you add weight. So that's going to be that. This is part four. It wasn't supposed to exist, but now it does. I was sort of supposed to make a Q&A about nucleus overload, but since I ma started making the hypertrophy Q&A, this has sort of replaced it. So if you have any questions, I'm actually going to take all of the questions from the previous nucleus overload videos, and I'm going to answer them in a special hypertrophy Q&A edition. So if you have additional ones, let me know in the comments. I will get to it. Thank you for watching. Uh, sorry again for the confusion and have a good day.